So, um, hello, good evening, everyone. Yeah, I hope all of you can hear me. Um, a warm welcome to all of you all who have joined us. Um, I must say it's, it's, it's a nice, nice weather out here where I am in Bangalore. And uh, to be discussing a book at this time, you know, perfect timing and a book like Mermaids in the Moonlight, I'm sure is going to be a blissful experience. Okay, um, the book we are going to be talking about is Mermaids in the Moonlight, which has been nominated for Atta Galata Bangalore Literature Festival Book Prize 2021. And uh, this has been nominated, as I told you, and it's been written by the lovely Sharanya Maniwannan, written and illustrated by her. And um, before I, uh, you know, share about my experiences about reading the book, I would like to tell a few things about uh, Sharanya. Sharanya, uh, this is her sixth book, and uh, this is her debut book as an illustrator. And um, this book has taught me a lot. I never knew that there was something called as mermaid literature. And um, Sharanya is an author, illustrator, and a poet. So um, when I got this book, say, a few days ago, the first thing that struck me was the generous, the lavish usage of the color indigo. You know, it was, it's been splashed everywhere, every page. And I'm a very visual person, you know, so indigo somewhere metaphorically uh, denoted or indicated, you know, the depth. Um, you know, secret underneath secret, stories underneath stories. Those are Sharanya's words in the book. So, um, and uh, many of y'all, I'm sure you'll agree with me, when I say mermaids, I think the, for me, the only book that came to my mind was The Little Mermaid, the, fair, the, the fairy tale, and a little bit of Korean drama, which I had watched, you know, how the mermaid comes to the land, she grows legs, and every time she cries, her tears become pearls. If they are happy tears, they are pink pearls. They're more precious. And that's about it. My knowledge about mermaids and in folklore was only so much. Um, talking to Sharanya, reading her lovely book uh, made me realize that there's a, a beautiful, you know, almost I can say it's a, a genre, a different, very different collection of mermaid literature, folklore all around the world, right? So um, over to you, Sharanya. How has the experience been, you know, creating a piece like this, creating a book like this? Um, what has been your experience, your journey? Uh, can you tell us more about the book? And of course, uh, why is this book important to you? How important is it to you? Thank you so much for those questions, Priya, and thank you to Atakalata and the Bangalore Literature Festival for having me here. Um, how do I begin? I should probably begin by telling you my personal connection to mermaids. Um, like many people of my generation, the Disney movie, The Little Mermaid, much more than Hans Christian Andersen's book, was what I was interested in, but also the only kind of mermaid that I knew. Um, and it's true what you said, uh, Priya, the concept of mermaid lore or mermaid literature is limited because this Eurocentric canon is all we know, but there are mermaid stories on every human inhabited continent. And my personal theory is that there are mermaid stories even um, you know, in, in places where there are no humans. Um, what drew me to make this book is that I am a member of the Ilangay Tamil diaspora. As a child, I lived in Colombo, but um, my family is from Batiklu in the east of Ilangay, or Sri Lanka. Um, and when I was a child and when I was growing up, I could not, my family could not uh, go back to Batiklu so easily. So, when I went there for the first time at the age of 27, I was extremely struck by how there are mermaids all over town. As you enter town, there's an arch, which is in the book, um, with three mermaids sitting atop it. There are mermaids on clock towers, there are mermaids on memorial plaques, there, there are mermaids on pillars, there are mermaids just on all kinds of public facades. 
And it was only then that I realized that something my mother would say when, uh, when I was little um, and obsessed with Disney's The Little Mermaid, she would say there's a mermaid in my hometown and she sings on full moon nights. And only then as an adult did I realize that there, there is something to it. And what intrigued me was how could you have this mythic figure everywhere? The symbolism is there, but the stories are not. And so I set out to try and find the stories. And what I found was a folkloric void. Um, but that void has various reasons for existing. And I've touched just lightly in Mermaids in the Moonlight on that, because this, this is really a book about mystery and uncertainty and being okay with not knowing some things. Um, in the graphic novel that follows this book, which will be out later this month. Um, that book is for adults. It's called Incantations Over Water. And in that, the mystery and the void and certain illusions perhaps are explored in greater depth. So that's sort of the origin point um, of this book. Okay. Um, I especially liked what you said just now. There are certain secrets, but it's okay if they are left like that. That's that's so beautiful. We are always in this particular pursuit to solve certain things, to find out, figure out things. But sometimes beauty lies in leaving things as they are, you know, as mysterious they are. Lovely. Okay. And um, so um, if I were to ask you, is there someone who inspired you, you know, a person? inspiration for your book? It was the place, not the place. any particular person, but mm -hmm. like anyone who is raised by adults who had to leave their homeland, uh, the longing of my grandparents influenced me deeply. My grandmother's desire to see the front porch of the house that she didn't know she was going back to, that influenced me deeply. But more than anything, it was the place. I myself longed to, to you know, um, not necessarily belong because that's complicated, but to at least forge some kind of relationship with the place that I would either have grown up in or else had been able to visit frequently, um, mm -hmm. had the, you know, the larger situation of the civil war um, not been a factor. And the mermaids were really what gave me that relationship that I craved because I was able to go to Matakalapu um, repeatedly telling myself I'm looking for mermaids. And that was much more um, easy on the emotions than you know, to tell myself I'm looking for something which I may never find um, emotionally and personally. So having this creative quest um, gave me so much more, so much more um, than I thought I could find. Because genuinely I set out with a certain set of theories about why there were no stories and all of those theories were dismantled. Mm -hmm. But I discovered so many new things about the culture, about the landscape, about current affairs, about history, and also about mermaids. Mm, lovely. And uh, the, the culture which you spoke about, the depth of it, you know, I could feel it in every page, you know. Uh, it's really culturally rich. One thing which um, kind of really stood out for me, actually not just one thing, uh, quite a few things, I would like to talk about them so that you can elaborate on them, um, is in the first page or so, you have mentioned that, um, you know, how much you respect and honor the cultural backgrounds of the folklore, the stories from the different back backgrounds it comes from. Now, as an artist, as a storyteller, most of us, we give a lot of importance to cultural appropriation. It's very important to all of us, the way we depict a certain culture. So these lines, they really resonated with me. So would you like to tell more about that? You know? Absolutely. Because I worked with law from around the world, I was terrified of being disrespectful, of appropriating. Um, and 
I feel that one may not always get it right, but one can set out with the intention of being respectful. And many people have told me that only after reading Mermaids in the Moonlight did they know about a certain mermaid from somewhere or a certain story from somewhere, but I am not the original teller. I'm somebody in a very long line of tellers and readers, in fact, mm -hmm. and through oral narrative and then later through records and also literature, um, these stories have traveled around the world. Right. Um, so I wanted to honor not just the cultures that these stories originate from, but the tellers who have kept them alive through the centuries. Okay. And I, I just felt that was the right, the right thing to do. Okay, wonderful. And the other thing, uh, Sharanya, I must tell you this, see, I'm already grinning because I like this part so much, is the choice of names for your characters. Uh, one is Mila Voli, uh, the girl in the story. And Mila Voli, as a Tamilian, I know, Mila Voli stands for Nila and the light, moonlight, right? And, um, and later you give an ex another explanation saying Nila Voli, which means the sound of the moon, sound in the moon, sound of moon and all of that. And the other thing is I read another piece of yours, um, Anbarasi, I fell in love with Anbarasi and the ribbon fish. Okay, such a beautiful name. You know, my heart fills with love when I say that word, Anbarasi, you know, queen of love. So Sharanya, so tell me, do you do a random pick when it comes to the names or do you, I mean, there's some meaning to it. Have, do you think a lot about it? So how do you go about naming your characters in your books? Thank you for that question. Um, Nilavari's name was not random at all. Uh, you know, it was very specifically um, chosen. And I, I thank you for looking up uh, the, the story Anbarasi and the Ribbon Fish. That's, that's one of my favorite pieces that I've written. And as you would have seen, it comes from the same landscape and the same culture. Mm -hmm. um, and that name was chosen because the, the Anbu is what her grandmother and her mother gave her. Um, and of course, in that story, it's uh, taken to an extreme, but she is a dot. She is the adored child. Mm -hmm. um, but in other books, I've not necessarily named all my characters. I have a short story collection for adults in which I think only two of the characters in some 20 odd stories, um, the narrators themselves are named. I, 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 it may not be two, but not, not everyone was named. But otherwise, I do care about the names of characters. They're not random. And of course, in this book, um, she had to have a distinctly Tamil name because this book does not exist in, um, you know, in, an, in a state of erasing what happened or, and what is happening to minorities, um, including the Tamil minority in Sri Lanka. Okay, okay. The other thing um, is, yeah, this is this is something which my daughter pointed out. Okay, and uh, this is with respect to your illustrations. So um, we can actually do this more as an experiment if we could close our eyes and think of a mermaid. Uh, our uh, listeners over here, just close your eyes. Think of the first image that comes to your mind, mermaid. Yeah, okay. I am sure to a larger extent, the mermaid in our heads, in our minds, is someone who has long curly hair, who has a slender body, uh, the so-called beauty being, which has been ingrained in our minds, conditioned, how we've been conditioned. But uh, what we notice, me and my daughter, is there are different kinds of mermaids in your book. There's a plus size mermaid, there's someone with blonde hair, someone who has braided hair, there's someone who is, um, you know, uh, who has a dark brown skin tone. I felt so happy looking at each one of them and each one of them, so much of detailing has gone into each one of them, you know? So that's such a welcome change 
um, I saw a lot of inclusivity in that. Would you like to talk more about it, the role that such illustrations play in children's minds when they read books like this? Thank you. Um, the inclusivity was deliberate. So as you pointed out, you've got uh, mermaids of different sizes, different colors. Um, there is a person in a wheelchair. Um, there, you know, there's the insinuation of queer love. Um, there's all of this in the book quite, quite deliberately. And one thing that I notice in contemporary children's literature is that in India, um, books being published in India, is that children can finally see themselves in books for possibly the first time. I certainly didn't have that growing up. And I think that's, that's wonderful. Um, that is how it should be, uh, you know. And the more that children can recognize themselves and the people they know in any kind of material that they consume, whether that's TV shows or books or something else, um, the more well-developed their sense of self and belonging in the world is. Um, it is certainly not, you know, it, it's certainly not a coincidence that Ariel, Disney's Ariel is the only mermaid that most of us think of. That's because the larger canon of mermaid law has just not been given importance deliberately um, by makers of different kinds of media. Um, so that somehow it just, it, people just don't realize it, that you've got African mermaids, you've got um, mermaids from uh, Aboriginal communities in Australia, um, First Nations mermaids, you've got Southeast Asian mermaids, you've got them from all over the world, and they look like the people of that region, or as they look like mythic figures, um, and they may not be beautiful, they may not be benevolent. Um, all these nuances, I really wanted to bring them out in the book while also making sure that it was more inclusive. So even the title page has got um, a, a voluptuous mermaid um, who looks a little like Ariel, who has the same colors, but also looks like many more people. She's my favorite. <laughs> okay. Um, the other thing is the fun part. I did manage to spot your self-portrait. You did. Okay. Yeah, I did. Which one you think it is? <laughs> I will show it to you. It's, it's, it's easy, actually speaking. Yeah. I read about it too. I was cheating a bit. <laughs> Yes, yes. I'm so happy that that's the one you decided because I have been accused, perhaps not, not unfairly, that too many of the mermaids look a little like me. But that one was a self-portrait <laughs> in, yeah. in one of my um, perennial states of hunger. Mm, okay. <laughs> and you, you have a, a, the traditional vare lay in front yeah. of you, the banana leaf. Yeah. Yes. And the, the, the other interesting or the fun part, I would say, is I don't even know how to call uh, this particular creation of yours. So you need to elaborate to me over here. Okay. Um, shall I also try showing it? Yes, yes, yes. Please go ahead. Yeah. So um, you could call it a mer cat mm -hmm. or you could call it a meow maid. <laughs> and I didn't come up with either of these terms. Um, there's lots of merchandise with sort of cat, you know, cat with fish-tailed cats out there. But uh, yes, I, I, I wanted to include a fish-tailed cat in my book. Is it only cats or are there other animals, you know, other species, I don't know, species of mermaids, more oh. cats? <laughs> More animals. Yeah, that's the beauty of um, creativity and imagination. And so, you know, especially if there are any kids watching now, I would like to suggest a little activity for you later on, which is why don't you pick your favorite animal and um, give that animal a fish tail and draw a portrait of it. 
So it could be a butterfly, it could be a dog, it could be a kangaroo, it could be whatever it is with a fishtail. And I'm sure it'll look very cute. I'm sure. <laughs> I'll try it out in my class tomorrow with my group of children. Lovely. Please let me know what they do. I will definitely, really definitely, definitely. So, um, yeah, so how has the response been so far? I'm sure you must have read out this book to your family members, your friends, um, you know, your acquaintances, children. So how, how has the response been? So this book has come out at um, a very difficult time for most people in India, mm -hmm. uh, including myself. So it has not really had um, the public life that you know a book normally would. I've not been able to go into schools and so on. I've just done a few virtual events like this. But I think the most gratifying response that I've had so far is um, I gave a copy to my grandfather who is from Matakanapur. And um, he is, I, I mean, he's, he's in his mid nineties. So his memory and so on are not very good. And one day I, I stepped out and I saw him uh, sitting in his usual chair, reading the book. And I said, oh, Abapa, you're reading it. Um, I need to take a photo of you. Um, and he said, I'm reading it for the second or third or fourth time. I don't know which, but it's a beautiful book. So that was really, really gratifying for me. I really do wish that despite the difficulties of the pandemic and, you know, um, everything that people have been through, uh, I, I do really wish that my mermaids can swim into more homes and schools. Um, I would love that. Sure, they will. Right. And um, what would you want your readers to take back home? Take away from your book, you know, feeling like what? I mean, if you were to say a takeaway for them from the book. So there are a few things. Um, firstly, belief in mystery, um, comfort with uncertainty. These are beautiful things. They expand the possibilities of how you experience the world. Uh, secondly, there is always more than what meets the eye. There are all, you think you know about something, but you look a little deeper. Mm. There's always more to find out. So, you know, as you said earlier, stories within stories and stories upon stories. And um, I, I think I forgot to mention at the beginning, but um, this is a real phenomenon. And I've experienced it myself on full moon nights in Batiklo, in Matakalapur. If you go into the Kaladi Lagoon, you can hear mysterious sounds from under the water. And no one is sure what they are. There's mm. research conducted at different points. Um, mm for at least a couple of centuries. They could be fish, they could be shells, they could be mermaids, they could be anything. So whether you want a scientific approach or some other kind of approach, there's still so much possibility in this mystery. Um, another thing that I would, one of the reasons I wrote this book um, is for children of the diaspora, of the Ilangay Tamil diaspora. Um, I, I don't know if it will, reach them, scattered mm. as we are around the world. But mm. I deeply hope that they will be able to find this book, which, um, which is about a place which they, they may not have been to, and perhaps even their parents haven't been able to go to. But they can travel there through this book. And um, you know, just one more step ahead of that is um, as as a Tamil from Batiklo, from Matakalapur, we don't get a lot of representation. Mostly people know only about Jaffna in the north. Mm. They do not know about how, they don't know our culture, they don't know much about us. There are, there are, there are very few books that have made it into English, either in translation or in the original, that deal with this part of the island. And okay. um, I, I wanted to create work that, you know, that, that represents where I am from. Beautiful, beautiful. Right, uh, one thing which I actually forgot to ask you earlier is as a reader, what I experienced 
um, even as a teller, as a storyteller, when you have to tell, say, two stories in half an hour, two folk tales from two different places, somewhere we need to find a, a flow, you know, something to connect it. Um, and I noticed that in your book, Yar leads to Yarpanam, Yarpanam leads to Lanka, king of Lanka, Ravana, and Ravana's daughter, whose name is Swarnamacha. And then you go ahead with um, her story. So once again, you know, the sequencing of these stories, because each of these story, um, stories are completely different. You know, there's completely different. How did you manage to string them together? Did you have a pattern in mind, something which kind of enabled you to do so? Um, I did have to work on the structure a little bit to kind mm -hmm. of form a narrative where there's a, um, you know, a flow, as you said, from one okay. story to the next. So that was, you know, that was very much a creative and editorial decision of being able to move the stories around so that this narrative was created. Okay. Um, yeah, so that I was able to do when I was writing. Mm -hmm. um, and I wrote before I started to draw. Okay, right. So who's your favorite mermaid? Uh, besides your self-portrait? <laughs> um, my favorite mermaid story is actually the story of Sedna. Okay. It's one of the okay. more painful stories um, mm -hmm. in this book, but that's a story that really speaks to me. Right. Um, another mermaid whom I deeply love is Yamanja. Huh. Um, and maybe I'll show her picture. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's time you showed us the illustrations. We've been talking a lot. I'm sure the others would like to see the pictures. See her. Is the image clear? Yes. So yes. she's one of my favorites. And um, in this book, uh, you know, I talk about her importance to people versus any kind of mythology itself. But um, Suvarna Macha is definitely uh, one of my favorite okay. novels. Yeah. And um, people are always surprised because they don't know, they don't know about her. Although in this country, many people are familiar with the Ramayana and its characters. Yeah. They don't know about yes. her. And, um, but I didn't make her up. She's very much a part of the culture and literature of Southeast Asia. Um, yeah. In fact, One. the only mermaid I made up is Ila. <laughs> okay. Would you like to show some of the illustrations? We've been talking a lot. Uh, so I'm sure those who are listening to us, they would like to have a glimpse. And those who would like to ask questions to Sharanya, please feel free and type your questions. Uh, we'll take them at the in, in another few minutes. Yeah. So I want to share this page. Yeah, it's clear. Go. You can tell. Yeah. You can see these women who are holding hands and looking into the water. And in their reflections, they're all fishtailed. And this is my favorite page of the book. And it's there because Matakalapu's dominant culture for centuries was matrilineal and matrilocal. Mm. Um, and in the course of my research, someone pointed out to me, and that is in the book, the symbol of the mermaid honors two things which were very important in that dominant culture. Firstly, um, mm. the Mukubar caste were fisher people traditionally. And mm. secondly, women, matrilocal, matrilo uh, matrilineal, so mm. women and fish. Okay. Yeah, so you put them together and you've got a mermaid. Um, so, you know, the, the symbolism and the cultural elements, as, as you pointed out, I tried to bring in as mm. many of them as I could um, while keeping it light and keeping it age sensitive. Um, and uh, the graphic novel goes into further depth uh, with this. So I'd like to show this moment. Okay. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So this is the one we were talking about earlier. Okay. 
And there are famous mermaids from everywhere. This is a European mermaid with two tails. Oh, yeah. Right. Um, Oh, I could, which ones? I like the stained glass one too. Oh, I will. I yeah, will. yeah. So this Go is Namacha. And she is not as famous as a lover, whom you will definitely recognize, I think. Um, a few more mermaids. Um, this page, in fact, deals a lot with Tamil culture and Tamil music um, and, uh, you know, even the, the mythic uh, subcontinent of Kumari Kandam. Mm. So we've got more mermaids. Um, where's this uh, stained glass mermaid? <laughs> the Cornish mermaid um, and my friend who is from Cornwall said it looks exactly like the church because this mermaid chair is very important. They have this chair in that church. They do not have this stained glass painting. Okay. That's my imagination. Okay. But they do have something called the mermaid chair um, in this church in Zenor. Um, and this is a First Nations Native American indigenous Mermaid. Right, right. And as you pointed out, they all they all look different. Um, and I should show you Amma and Milovoli and Ila right here. Yeah. Love. And this is the it's a shiny mirror-like cover. <laughs> Yeah, lovely, lovely it is. It was. So um, I think we've come to the end of the session and there have been no questions so far. Um, um, Sharanya had a wonderful idea of, you know, if children had joined us, we could have a drawing activity, which she had mentioned earlier. But now that um, uh, children are going to be watching our recorded version, so Sharanya, would you like to tell them how to go about this activity? You did mention, would you like to... Uh, say that once again, you know. Sure. Let me show you the mermaid cat again. Here you go. Um, so it's very simple. Your favorite animal, whether it's a panda, whether it's a dog or a caterpillar, yeah. you know, whatever it may be, just um, draw the head and the, the upper body and then draw a fish tail and you know you can name it you can write a story about it you can do whatever you like um and that's your own mommy character okay great so thank you so much sharanya it was wonderful talking to you truly i'm so glad that i met you though it's been virtual uh wishing you all the very best congratulations best wishes would love to see and hear and read many more stories from you Thank you so much, Priya. Really, really appreciate it. Thank you for this wonderful conversation.